So on this podcast, we are going to discuss the anesthetic management of the pregnant patient who comes to the operating room for non-obstetric surgery. And this is a relatively common event. It's been determined that about 1 to 2 percent of all pregnant women undergo surgery at some point during their pregnancy. So this amounts to about 75,000 anesthetics per year being performed in the U.S. on pregnant women other than obstetric surgeries. And the types of surgeries that are most commonly seen are appendectomies, cholecystectomies, other laparoscopic procedures, ovarian cystectomies, and then of course you have the patients with trauma, uh, those who have a uh, cancer diagnosis or chronic oncologic surgery during pregnancy, and then patients um, with cardiac problems oftentimes that manifest themselves during pregnancy, and also craniotomy, remembering that um, in terms of rupture of of cerebral aneurysms in women of childbearing age, a significant proportion of those occur in women when they are pregnant. Now there are certain things that we need to keep in mind that make this a different anesthetic than for a patient who's not currently pregnant. One is the physiologic changes of pregnancy and how that affects your anesthetic management, and we went over uh, that primarily. Um, it's very the same issues, the same principles as when you're doing obstetric anesthesia in the pregnant patient. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the possible teratogenicity of anesthetic drugs, or actually the lack thereof, but what the evidence is. Uh, other things you need to make sure that you're doing is um, things like maintaining uteral placental perfusion, and we'll talk a little bit about um, prevention of premature labor. So um, in terms of teratogenicity and anesthetic drugs, um, first into, to understand teratogenicity, there are certain factors that are going to influence the teratogenic potential of a drug. One is species susceptibility, and this is important to know because just because another species um, has a ter- teratogenic effect to a particular medication, that doesn't mean humans will. And so this makes it difficult in terms of assessing safety of drugs because you can't count on the results from animal studies. The dose of the drug will affect its teratogenic potential. The duration, and especially important, the timing of when the exposure during the pregnancy occurred. And there may also be some genetic predisposition. In terms of how teratogenicity manifests, we mostly think of it as structural abnormalities, the patient with a cardiac defect, a a cleft palate, things like that. But also, if um, exposure to the the medication leads to fetal death, growth restriction, or functional deficiencies, meaning after delivery over the childhood time, the the child shows behavioral or learning problems, um, those are also considered manifestations of teratogenicity. Now, what about specifically anesthetic drugs? So first of all, Let's talk about the effect of the stage of gestation at the time of exposure. As I said, that's one of the important principles. Um, And when the exposure occurs during the pregnancy will determine, first of all, the target organ, what's affected, and then the type and the severity of the defect. Now, most structural abnormalities will occur very early in pregnancy during organogenesis, which generally in human pregnancy occurs between days 31 and 71. Now the CNS system though develops over a longer period of time and so you can see CNS structural abnormalities occur even when you have exposure to drugs later into pregnancy up to about day 126. Um, And then once you have the structural development of the CNS, the maturation of the CNS occurs over an even longer period of time and so you can see functional deficiencies in the neonate and the child um, due to a particular in utero drug exposure, um, even when that exposure occurs late in pregnancy. Now, in terms of what do we know about teratogenicity specifically of anesthetic drugs? Well, first of all, there are no prospective clinical studies that have been done. You're just not going to do that, a study on pregnant women to see the effects of a drug. So the information that we have on the safety of anesthetic drugs comes from essentially three areas. One is from small animal studies, but as I said, the problem with that is that just because a drug is teratogenic in one species does not mean it will be teratogenic in another species. Um, 
So there are lots of animal studies of drugs that have been used routinely in normal pregnant women without any adverse effects that if you look at the, those drugs use in animals, you'll see um, defects. Um, another big area where we get our information about the safety of anesthetic drugs is in looking at outcome studies of pregnant women who underwent surgery and looking at the medications they were exposed to. And then finally, um, some extrapolation from OR personnel, and this is more related specifically to the volatile agents. Um, there have been some probably um, questionable conclusions made based on pregnancy outcomes in women working in ORs and also in dental offices in terms of exposure to, to some of the anesthetic gases. Now, when we talk about um, using various drugs in pregnancy, the FDA has a use in pregnancy um, categorization. So those categories are A through D and then X. So category A um, means that there are controlled studies that, that showed no risk of using the drug in pregnancy. And there's virtually, if any, very few studies that have been done specifically in pregnant women. So you're going to find very few drugs that are considered class A. Class B are those in which there's no evidence of risk in humans. There haven't been any sort of prospective controlled trials, but there may be a long history of women receiving these anesthetic drugs without any evidence of risk. Uh, class C is very similar to B, really, in that risk can't be ruled out, but there isn't any positive evidence of risk. And so drugs get put into Class C generally um, if there have, for instance, been animal studies showing adverse effects, but yet there have been no reports in humans. Um, just because of those adverse effects in, in animal species, a drug may get categorized as Class C. Uh, also, if there aren't any isn't a big body of evidence of the use of the drug being used in pregnancy, it may get a category C. Category D is where there's positive evidence of risk, and an example of this would be our benzodiazepines. Uh, there were some retrospective studies of chronic use of benzodiazepines, primarily in women with some sort of anxiety or, or psychologic problems, where they found an association with cleft lip and palate, and as a result of that, Although there have been no evidence of short-term use of benzodiazepines causing teratogenicity, the benzodiazepines are categorized as class D, meaning positive evidence of risk. And then class X is drugs that are just absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy. And so thalidomide would be an example of a drug that is class X. So talking about some of our specific drugs that we use, what about our IV induction agents? There haven't been any reports of an association between the use of any of the IV induction agents and, and teratogenicity in humans. And if you look in the PDR, all of your IV induction agents are going to be categorized as either um, ca use in pregnancy category B or C. Uh, similar with our neuromuscular blocking drugs and our opioids, all of those, again, no association found with human teratogenicity in either category B or C. And finally, in terms of regional anesthesia with local anesthetics, again, long-term history of their safety, um, they're all going to be within category B or C. Now, as I mentioned, um, the benzodiazepines are classified by the FDA as category D, meaning there's positive evidence of risk. Now, this was based on retrospective surveys that found an association between diazepam and cleft lip and palate. And as I said, these were um, patients who were taking it, you know, on a regular basis. There have been no large prospective studies that have found any association between the use of benzodiazepines and teratogenicity. And most certainly there's no data to show that a single dose of a benzodiazepine used as part of an anesthetic is harmful. On the other hand, you have the medical legal issue of if you use the drug in pregnancy and then the baby has some sort of problem at delivery, some sort of defect, um, someone still may want to blame the drug that you gave. So I think whenever you're using benzodiazepines in pregnant women, you need to weigh the risks and benefits before you use them. If you absolutely need the drug, absolutely go ahead and use it. On the other hand, if it's just to give some mild anxiolysis before surgery, it's not essential, I would probably avoid using the drug. What about our volatile anesthetics? Um, volatile anesthetics under normal physiologic conditions have not been shown to be teratogenic in animal studies. 
And in surveys of OR personnel and in retrospective analysis of pregnant women who've undergone general anesthesia, they've not found any increase in congenital anomalies. Now, is there uh, any concerns about the use of anesthetics in terms of long-term um, neuro neurologic function, cognitive deficits? That's, as we know, there's lots of controversy about the use both in, in infants and young, young toddlers and also some data maybe about during in utero exposure and effects on that, but that is all very much um, unknown at this time. There's still much more work to be done to look at that. What about nitrous oxide? This is another drug that's controversial. Certainly there have been animal studies that have found teratogenicity. However, when you look at those studies and look at the dose and the duration, that it was prolonged exposure. If you look at the gestational duration of that species and compare it to the how long gestation occurs in human pregnancy, the amounts of nitrous oxide that was used in these animal studies could be the equivalent of a woman getting nitrous oxide for a day or two, which we, we wouldn't do. So it's hard to extrapolate for that. Now, why is there controversy? Because certainly, if you, if you look at nitrous oxide, there would be reasons to think that it might be teratogenetic. Uh, we know that nitrous oxide um, inactivates methionine synthetase, which will affect DNA synthesis. Um, so there, the, you may expect that there might be teratogenicity. Um, what's interesting, though, is that in animal studies, it was found that when they administered volatile agent along with nitrous oxide, it prevented teratogenic effects. And it led them, the investigators, to believe that actually the teratogenicity that was being seen in animal studies may have actually been related to sympathetic stimulation from the nitrous oxide with decrease in uterine blood flow being implicated in the abnormalities that occurred. With the idea of being with the, with the addition of the volatile agent, you minimize that sympathetic stimulation, and that's why when you added a volatile agent to nitrous oxide, you did not see teratogenicity. Um, the human data about teratogenicity comes again from retrospective reviews of women who have undergone surgery and also um, in reproductive outcome studies in women who have occupational exposure. And this would be primarily people working in dental offices. Um, in all of that human data, there's been no evidence of an increased risk of congenital anomalies with the use of nitrous oxide. There's been some weak data suggesting an increased risk of spontaneous abortion, but most of this came from dental offices in which they were not scavenging for the nitrous oxide, so I really don't think that you can um, conclude much about um, the ill effects of nitrous oxide based on that data. Now, what about um, when you look at, <coughs> so that's teratogenicity. Now, let's move on to just fetal outcomes and what we know about um, fetal outcomes with non-obstetric surgery. So, what we do know is that when you look at fetuses whose moms had surgery during pre pregnancy versus fetuses whose moms did not have surgery, there's no evidence of an increased incidence of congenital anomalies in those babies whose moms had surgery. There does seem to be an increase in the incidence of spontaneous abortions, intrauterine growth restriction, and perinatal mortality. However, it, there, there isn't evidence to support that it's the anesthetic drugs or anything like that. And more likely, it's that maybe relo related to the surgical procedure, especially the site of the surgery, especially for spontaneous abortion. For instance, if you do a pelvic surgery, you're more likely to see that. Um, but even more importantly, a lot of the issues of intrauterine growth restriction, perinatal mortality, is very likely related to the underlying maternal condition that has required the patient to have surgery versus the surgery itself or the anesthetic itself. And we do know that there's no evidence to show that any particular type of anesthetic affects outcome one way or the other, either worse outcome or better outcome. Now, a major com um, thing that you need to consider when you're anesthetizing a pregnant patient in the main operating room is making sure that you do whatever you can to maintain normal, adequate uteral placental perfusion and, and fetal oxygenation. So how are you going to do this? Well, first of all, um, you want to maintain a normal maternal PO2. A transient decrease is usually going to be well tolerated, but if you do have prolonged maternal hypoxemia during your anesthetic, that can lead to fetal death. 
Um, maternal hyperoxia is not a problem. It's not detrimental to the fetus. So unlike in the neonate where there's a, a push to not use high concentrations of oxygen in the fetus, that's, that's not an issue. You do want to avoid um, maternal respiratory depression and hypercapnia because this can lead to fetal acidosis that then also leads to fetal myocardial depression. On the other hand, you also want to avoid maternal hyperventilation. If you do, if the mother develops a respiratory alkalosis, this will lead to a uterine artery vasoconstriction and there, and there ultimately to decrease uterine placental perfusion. Also, if you have hyperventilation, um, you will have a shift of your maternal oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve to the left, which will then make oxygen unloading to the fetus more difficult. Also, you want to maintain normal blood pressure during an anesthetic in a pregnant patient in order to make sure you have adequate uterine placental perfusion. So even though you're not up on the labor and delivery unit when you're taking care of this patient in the main OR, you want to think about um, some of the pregnancy-specific causes of hypotension, such as aortic cable compression. Um, also remember that you can have decreased MAC. Um, so you may have a relative overdose, although as we mentioned in an earlier podcast, it's now looking like in terms of anesthetic level, although MAC is decreased, that's more at the level of a, a spinal reflex, and um, probably you don't need significantly less volatile agent to get the same depth of anesthesia. But anything that you can do to avoid, avoid maternal hypotension, such as left uterine displacement, if you're doing some sort of an neuraxial block, making sure that you're aggressive in treating any hypotension and doing things like fluid loading and um, prophylactic vasopressors to prevent hypotension. Now, what about intraoperative fetal monitoring? Uh, this is kind of a controversial topic. This is a decision whether or not you're going to do intraoperative fetal monitoring needs to made, be made in collaboration with both the obstetrician and the surgeon. Uh, first of all, when can you do it? It's not even technically possible to do intraoperative fetal monitoring or continuous fetal monitoring until you reach at least 18 or so weeks gestation. You also have to think about the site of surgery um, because that may make it difficult. For instance, if it's a pelvic or abdominal surgery, it can be very difficult. Now, it's been reported that there are um, ultrasound probes where you can put a cover on and you can have a sterile ultrasound probe but still it's very cumbersome if you're working in the pelvis or abdomen to also try to be monitoring the fetus although that would be one of the more higher risk surgeries that you'd like to know what's going on. The other thing to understand is is that if you are going to do intraoperative fetal monitoring someone needs to be present who is trained in, inter in interpreting that fetal heart trace. Um, so that's not going to be you as the anesthesiologist. Most, if any of us, have not had official training in monitoring fetal heart tones. But secondly, we are busy monitoring the mom. Usually it's going to be a labor and delivery nurse who will be sent down to, to monitor the fetus if that's going to be done during surgery. Um, I will tell you that um, in terms of getting the obstetricians on board, Oftentimes, our obstetricians, and this is not just unique to here, do not want to monitor the fetus. And what ACOG actually says about this is that the decision to use intraoperative monitoring should be individualized. And if it is used, um, your decision should be based on gestational age, the type of surgery, and the facilities that are available. Um, so, for instance, if you are talking about doing surgery at a place where you don't have the capability to do a cesarean delivery, then you're probably not going to do intraoperative fetal monitoring. And one survey actually looked at, um, surveyed, I think, primarily high-risk obstetricians about whether or not when they're doing um, surgery in pregnant patients, if they would routinely use intraoperative fetal monitoring, and less than 50 percent, about 43 percent, said they would. So the majority do not routinely use intraoperative fetal monitoring, but in certain situations they may choose to. Now, why would we as anesthesiologists want intraoperative fetal monitoring? Personally, I think it would be nice whenever you have at least a viable fetus to have an intraoperative um, fetal monitor on and available because, first of all, even if I'm not going to deliver the baby, if there's abnormalities, if I see abnormalities on the fetal monitor, I can look at what I'm doing and see, is there something I could do to optimize the mother? So if it starts looking like they're having some late decelerations, well, can I increase mom's FiO2 to increase oxygen delivery to the fetus? Uh, can I bump up mom's blood pressure if she's got sort of a sagging blood pressure, again, to help optimize uteroplacental placental perfusion and oxygen delivery? 
If you are going to do intraoperative fetal monitoring, though, there has to be a plan in place before you get started, made in conjunction with the surgeon and the obstetrician, as to what you are going to do if that fetal heart tracing does show persistent fetal compromise. So if that's the case, is the obstetrician going to be called to come do an emergent C-section, or are we just going to watch it and do whatever we can to optimize maternal status? Those sorts of plans have to be in place if you're going before you get started if you're going to use intraoperative fetal monitoring. Now, if you're using intraoperative fetal monitoring, you also have to understand that some of the drugs you're using um, as anesthetics are going to affect your fetal tracing. And you need to be able to distinguish what might be the effects of the drugs versus what is fetal hypoxia. So first of all, um, when you have an anesthetized mother under general anesthesia, if you do fetal monitoring, you really can only assess the baseline fetal heart rate and the presence or absence of decelerations. All of the drugs we give, opioids, induction agents, inhalational anesthetics, they all are going to be so you really cannot comment in, an, in, a, in, a, in a woman under general anesthesia on the fetal heart rate variability. Uh, you also have to understand, although you can assess fetal, baseline fetal heart rate, some of the drugs we give can affect the baseline fetal heart rate. For instance, uh, vasoactive drugs that cause maternal tachycardia can also produce fetal tachycardia. Uh, so if you give atropine to mom or if you give tributylene to mom, you may see an increase in fetal heart rate. Also, you can see specifically with beta blockers, there have been reports of fetal bradycardia with beta blockers that are, are drug-induced. Now, another, so we've talked about teratogenicity. We've talked about strategies for making sure we maintain uterine placental perfusion. We've talked about whether or not we're going to do fetal heart rate monitoring. If we are, what are our plans? And then the other thing that we worry about when we're doing non-obstetric surgery in pregnant women is the concern about precipitating premature labor. So we do know that women who undergo surgery during pregnancy do have an increased incidence of preterm labor and preterm delivery. There are certain risk factors for developing premature labor, and that relates to when in gestation the patient is at. So m greater risk of going into preterm labor with surgery if the woman is in her third trimester. And then the site of surgery. Pelvic and abdominal surgery is more likely um, to precipitate preterm labor than surgery in other areas, including a peripheral surgery on the arm or leg, something like that. We do know that no anesthetic agent or technique has been proven to either increase or decrease the risk of developing preterm labor. Um, although I would say when you're using your, choosing your anesthetic, although there's no evidence, you can provide an anesthetic can, that can also um, affect your uterine tone to go ahead and do that. So if the patient will tolerate it, as we've talked about before, your volatile agents do decrease uterine tone. So that could actually be beneficial in the setting of non-obstetric surgery where you don't want this woman delivering. Um, also understand if you're taking care of an unstable patient and you uh, want to use an induction drug that maintains hemodynamic stability, uh, remember that ketamine in doses larger than a milligram per kilo can increase uterine tone. So in that setting, you might prefer to use Atomidate. Now, um, there's always talk about timing of non-obstetric surgery. Is there a time that is is best done if surgery is going to be done during pregnancy. Well, first of all, any elective surgery should just be delayed until after the pregnancy. If the surgery does not have to be done right away, then it shouldn't be done until after delivery. If it's possible, um, you would like to avoid surgery in the first trimester, which is during that time period of organogenesis. And what we know is that the optimal time to do a surgery in pregnancy is going to be in the second trimester. The reason for that being, number one, your organogenesis is pretty much completed at this point, and you're at low risk for preterm labor. Um, in the first trimester, as I said, you're worried about any potential effects of drugs on, on fetal development. In the third trimester, you're now at higher risk for developing preterm labor. But the reality is most surgeries that are done during pregnancy are not elective surgeries. They're being done for serious illness or injury in the mother, and they really can't be delayed despite um, what the gestational age is. Now, in terms of your anesthetic management, you've talked now about what your goals are going to be, so some specifics. In terms of your preoperative management, of course, you want to document not only medical history, but any sort of pregnancy complications. Uh, you want to do, obviously, a careful assessment of the airway. You need to get an obstetrics consult 
um, and have them see the patient and document fetal heart tones before you do your anesthetic. And of course, these women are full stomach, so they should have aspiration prophylaxis preoperatively. In terms of your anesthetic technique, a lot of this is going to depend on the maternal condition as well as the site and nature of the surgery. So if you have a patient who's got abdominal trauma and is unstable, of course you're going to need to do a general anesthetic with um, a technique that will help maintain hemodynamic stability. On the other hand, if you have a woman who comes in that broke her arm or something and she needs that surgically repaired, um, you're probably going to prefer to do regional if you can. Patient preference is going to play a role, um, but if it can be done in a regional, I think most of us would prefer in pregnant patients to do an anesthetic that's, that's, that's regional. Um, due to maternal considerations, as with any pregnant women, you know that we have increased risk of aspiration, potential difficult airway. Although, as I said, none of our anesthetic drugs have been shown that there's evidence that there's adverse effects, um, less fetal drug exposure makes sense, especially in this um, time where there is a lot of research going on with some suggestions that possibly fetal as well as neonatal and toddler exposure to anesthetics may affect long-term cognitive um, function. Um, in terms of, although there are, so it seems like there are definitely benefits to doing regional anesthesia, need to understand that there's actually been no data to support any sort of improved fetal outcome with any specific anesthetic technique. If you do do regional anesthesia, you want to make sure that you have adequate intravenous fluid preload before a neural, neural an neuraxial anesthetic. If you're at 20 weeks or greater, you should be um, instituting left uterine displacement. I would recommend supplemental oxygen in these patients and aggressive management of any sort of neuraxial induced hypotension. Uh, I personally will use sedation when I'm doing regional anesthesia, only if it's really necessary. Um, because, number one, I want to make sure that I don't get too deep with my sedation such that the patient can't maintain um, her airway reflexes, especially since she's considered a full stomach. So if I'm going to do any sedation, I'm only going to do it if it's really needed, and I'm going to do just moderate sedation where she can continue to protect her airway. If I am going to sedate, I am personally, unless I absolutely need to, I'm going to avoid benzodiazepines just so I get away from using a class D drug in a pregnant woman. If I'm doing general anesthesia, again, left uterine displacement, need to make sure that just like with a cesarean delivery that the patient's adequately pre-oxygenated and you do a rapid sequence induction. Again, just like on the labor and delivery suite for C-section, um, maybe a higher risk of difficult intubation, so have your equipment ready, have that algorithm in the back of your head. Generally, propofol is going to be my preferred induction agent. If I have an unstable patient and I need to maintain hemodynamic stability, I often will use Atomidate, but if for some reason I feel that I need to use ketamine, I'm going to restrict my dose to one milligram per kilo or less and, and no more than that because of the potential adverse effects may have by increasing uterine tone. Um, throughout anesthesia, you should maintain your FiO2 at, at least 50% to maintain adequate fetal um, oxygenation. As I mentioned before, you want to maintain normal carbon. We tend sometimes to really hyperventilate patients, but you don't want to do that in this setting because if you get maternal alkalosis, as I mentioned, um, you can have decreased uteal placental perfusion. Of course, aggressively treat hypotension. Um, in terms of anesthetic maintenance with general anesthesia, I do find that if the patient will tolerate it, that a volatile agent may be useful because it can um, decrease uterine tones. It's also been shown to decrease uterine vascular resistance. Um, in terms of the use of opioids, there's no evidence that there's adverse fetal effects from using opioids provided that delivery is not imminent and the opioids are not being given long term. Because if they're being given over a long period of time, then you worry about an opioid addicted fetus, um, and if you're giving opioids and deliveries imminent, you worry about respiratory depression associated with the opioids. In terms of nitrous oxide, personally, I will avoid nitrous oxide unless there's a significant advantage to the mother, which is not very often. Again, because of those concerns in animal studies about teratogenicity, and although poorly done retrospective studies, small potential for increased 
spontaneous abortion. If I do use nitrous oxide, I'm going to use 50% or less. Um, any of the anomalies that were reported in animal studies, as I said, were associated with higher concentration and long duration, and certainly as a result of the fact that the teratogenicity was associated with long-term duration of nitrous oxide, I'm going to avoid using the drug in any um, surgeries that are expected to be very long. In terms of post-operative management, um, afterwards, if this is a if it's a not if it's a pre-viable fetus, you want to make sure that if you weren't doing continuous fetal heart rate monitoring during surgery, which most likely you weren't, that there um, that the fetal heart tones are are rechecked. If you have a bi viable fetus, in addition to fetal heart rate tracing, you want to um, monitor uterine activity to make sure that you also have not precipitated preterm labor. And so for anyone that's at viability who's undergone an anesthetic, generally these patients are going to be, after an initial PACU stay, extended, have extended monitoring on the labor and delivery unit, usually for up to 24 hours, so they can monitor fetal heart rate for fetal well-being as well as uterine activity to rule out the development of preterm labor. Um, Postoperative, these patients, like everyone else, needs um, adequate analgesia. Regional analgesia uh, may certainly be preferable in these patients. Um, it will avoid the effects of systemic opioids on fetal heart rate variability because if mom's getting a lot of opioids and you're trying to monitor the baby just like when she was anesthetized, you're not going to be able to, um, to uh, document fetal heart rate variability. And then finally realize that these patients are um, hypercoagulable being pregnant, so they are at risk of thrombo, higher risk of thromboembolic events, so there needs to be attention to prophylaxis, be that sequential compression devices in all of these patients. I think that would be mandatory. In some patients, like trauma patients or some other patients who've had major surgeries, they're not ambulating much, may also talk about um, some low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis. And so that is sort of an overview of the considerations when providing anesthesia for non-obstetric surgery in the pregnant patient. Thank you.